I, it, I know I'll have Holly mostly from the Divination Studio there. I haven't heard back from Raquel. I don't know how she's doing. I know she was sick. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then yeah. I'm not sure of Karen, but I'm going to the first session, even if it's just me, I'm going to play out with the four minors as the four psychological functions. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, arguably, if, if I'm feeling up to it, um, I would be willing to come on and be a, a straight man for you. <laughs> Give me a line. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> only, for, only for a while because, uh, uh, you know, that's the day we do advanced reading groups. So, um, yeah, and that's why I'm doing it on that day because I already have that in the middle. It's 11 to 1 here. Yeah. So for me to drive to the plaza for two, three hours and then come back is a little ridiculous. So I'm I'm trying to pack my Wednesdays with move my accounting, invoicing, file admin uh -huh. to Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday morning. Um, just well, so I don't have days with onesie meetings. Yeah. You know, that's I, that way I have at least three days a week where I have my time to, you know make money so I can keep doing this stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, that sounds good. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what we have to, in the end, that's what it comes down to. In yeah, just end, get the schedule right. You figure it out that, um, you know, there's there's no brass ring at the at the end of the round roundabout. <laughs> so you, you better find out what, what you enjoy and, mm -hmm. do, and do that. And, and then at uh, the same time, if you don't keep your eyes up and on the road, um, you'll never see a rainbow. So, right. <laughs> no. right. So we have Neil, we have Art. Good morning, Art. Nice to oh, see cool. you today. Art Patterson is here. Um, and so I, I've been struggling along with um, uh, the sele selected letters. That's a wiener. Uh, 76. Uh, you know, I'm not entirely convinced because um, um, I finally came to the conclusion that the pound was extremely idealistic, and and uh, you think? <laughs> yeah, and I think that the <laughs> the guy who did the collected the uh, letters, selected letters, or the did the forward to it. Um, he sort of summed it up that, you know, Pound never saw an institution he didn't like. And, and that's the issue uh, mm -hmm. because he, he was, you know, he was talking about, he was talking about the idea of the perfection of the United States in a way. I mean, that's what 76 is about. And it's it's putting it in the context of the contos and how you know he's embedding that into literature okay fine um but you know i think jung had it more accurately and th this is where pound uh, slipped off the path, so to speak. <laughs> well, I think, I think pound, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, there's the pesky idealism of youth, you know, 18 to 30. Yeah. Um, and then, then that tempers and some people die creatively and some people continue. And, yeah. but I think pound um, had a similar intensity to young except that Pound would tend to believe his own bull and, yeah. and stay in his work rather than letting the mastery in his work lead into further discovery. And he always popped his head back out. I mean, so James Joyce's daughter, he'd drown in his own work and then he'd come up surface. He'd drown in his own work. He'd come to the surface. Mm -hmm. Whereas Jung kind of kept the, you know, the Nordic compass, the Iolite, the, mariner's star internally to always keep to let the work drive it even though 
he was the driver. So I, 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 I agree that Jung had a, a vastly more, I think, expansive and respi- refined perspective to pour all his work into. And then Pound would kind of get full of himself enough yeah. that he, he let, in a sense, he paid too much attention to his work, which sounds stupid in one way, but the discipline of the ritual is important in your work. But, but, but the I'm all that kind of paying attention is, um, and he didn't seem egomaniacal. He, he seemed no, he, to be, he definitely old. was and not. I, I mean, he and definitely... he's a leader and a businessman and yep. he could, he could listen, but I think he listened to himself more than he listened to other people. Right. You know, and, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but I do agree from that perspective that, that Jung had a better handle, I think on his own intensity from that perspective. And, um, Just wondering where I put it now. Um, when I made a mark too, I mean, when we get to, you know, we, we want to do some kind of syllabus outlining of let's do some culture homework of, of uh, a couple two and a half ish paragraphs from 76. And then one from the selected letters that, that, uh, that seem to speak to modern culture actually. Yeah. When we get um, there. Well, you know, uh, he kept running into things that that uh, you know knocked him knocked him for a loop, but he didn't mind. He uh, I, because there was this one passage in here I didn't find it, but uh, the story was that um, that he was teaching at Wabash College in in. Indiana at one point and um, and he was out I don't know he was out doing something in the evening and on his way home he found a, a homeless woman who was cold and, and needed a place to stay and so he brought her into his boarding house and he had mm-hmm. her sleep on his bed and he slept on the floor and the, the next day he went out leaving her in the bed and the people who came up to clean the room, of course, found this young woman. Right. And, and uh, the ladies who ran the boarding house got uh, shocked by that and wrote the president of the college and made a big stink about it and, and basically ran or him out of town. town yeah. Out of town on a rail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and so, I have to say, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. So right, right. <laughs> and um, so anyway, um, I can imagine him in that place where he's consumed with his work that night, and yeah. he just sees her, and it's, oh, she's hungry. I've been hungry before. We should yeah. we should remedy that. I mean, where you know, where even the next day piece, the accusation worse than you know the quote unquote guilt or crime, um, which that wouldn't have been, but um, probably the furthest thing from his mind. And that, in that sense, there's the. I think that actually goes back to your statement of Jung and him. Pound had a certain naivete that he kept along for, for the ride. He certainly did. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess this comes up in a, in one of his first letters to uh, William Carlos Williams, where he's thanking him for. Um, ah, yes. He's saying he's, thanking Williams for criticizing him. And he says, how can I get better if nobody criticizes me, right? Right. It's like me saying, make as many mistakes as you can, as fast as you can, um, because mm-hmm. that's how we learn, right? right. And, and so, um, you know, it, uh, where's this? I, I did find the passage finally. Um, But then I've lost, well, oh, here it is. Uh, 
if anybody ever shuts you in Indiana for four months and you don't at least write some unconstrained something or other, I'd give up hope for your salvation. <laughs> Again, if you ever get degraded, branded with infamy, et cetera, for feeding a person who needs food, uh, you will probably rise up and bless the present and sacred name of Madame Grundy for all her holy hypocrisy. I'm not getting I am not getting bitter. I have been more than blessed for my kindness, and the few shekels cast on the water have come back to me tenfold, and I have no fight with anybody. Okay, so mm, yeah. Uh, so his his point is generosity repays itself very much but right. here's here's the footnote so i'll just read the footnote uh pound spent the winter of 1907 at wabash Co college crawfordsville indiana where he taught french and spanish after having read late one night he went into town through a blizzard to mail a letter on the streets he found a girl from a stranded burlesque show penniless and with nowhere to go. The centennial history of the college records that he fed her and took her to his rooms where she spent the night in his bed and he on the floor of his study. Early in the morning, he left for an eight o'clock class. The Mrs. Hall from whom he rented the rooms went up after his departure for the usual cleanup, cleaning. Uh, they were maiden ladies in a small Midwestern town and had let th those rooms before only to an elderly professor. <laughs> they telephoned the president of the college and several trustees. The affair was made public. Only one outcome was possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's busy body people. I don't want to say that with a gender slant, um, but yeah. just nosy Nosy Neils and Nosy Nancy. Actually, I'll, let me use a different word. We have a Neil on the YouTube. I don't want to insult, um, but the nosy ones. Yeah, and so we have, um, so we have the point of his generosity and the fact that that he, um, you know, throughout his life was was uh, helping people, mm -hmm. and and uh, and they knew it. And he right. made he did make an error because he was so idealistic as to believe Mussolini and his idealistic dreams, right? And you know the the fascist idea that we can make the perfect state and everything will be hunky dory, and um, and did insert never found an institution he didn't like, and that was relatively polar to the U.S., which he didn't like at the time. Therefore, right. that's the side to go to pick. I mean, right. So, so he ends up getting himself arrested and thrown in the the loony bin, <laughs> not in prison. Right. Well, you know, if we look at especially the generosity repays itself. Now, okay, let's take the Wabash College example. Yeah. All he's doing is teaching French and Spanish. So. This becomes then a catalyst for him to move it, move it along. Yeah. And so his life, even his generosity, where initially it would get rebuffed and um, denied or squelched, it then put him into the next segment of, well, what's happening next? And so in a sense, he had multiple life phases quicker than lots of people. He mm. wouldn't stick in a spot too terribly long, any longer than necessary until he, you know, naively screwed something up and then got to move to the next. But it, in that sense that I won't say screw it up, catalyzed his evolution to keep, to keep living, to keep exploring right. new scenarios. And that's what we have to do. And I think that there's, uh, well, as I, I look through here, first of all, let me ask if there's any letter that you particularly want to point to. Um, yeah, if, actually, I wanted to point to um, two and a half paragraphs in 76 and then a specific letter. Um, when, 
in letter number 76 or page? Um, no, in, in 76. Oh, in 76. Okay. I'm it's sorry. kind of a preface or preamble to then the letter I wanted to read. Um, okay. And, and where, it's where on page, it? page 166. 166. And there are paragraph numbers in this one. So it, it starts with the, the first full paragraph about seven lines down. The Homeric okay. prophecies. Yeah, right. Okay. And I ignored the Roman numerals. I'm assuming they um, apply to the Cantos numbers. But um, yes, they do. That's true. So I, I kind of, I read, didn't kind of, I did. I just read right through those. Um, so I will read them out loud so that they're in the YouTube. People can refer to them if they want. Right. But I ignored them in the context of finding a different dynamic match in, in the selected letters. Right. Okay. The Homeric prophecies, one, projected a Renaissance tradition of continuing revolution, one through four. Through it, one they through now, six. One through <laughs> yeah. six. Thank you. Through it, they now project a usable Renaissance tradition continuing into the 20th century, one through seven. The epiphanies of seal sports projected Renaissance protagonists awakening a 20th century protagonist, seven. Such protagonists now project a usable Renaissance protagonist and his plan for a Renaissance, eight to 11. The quest for new justice, three. Projected prototypic new founding, eight through nine. Thence it now projects new world founding, new world founding, American 12 and Chinese 13. The inspirations of four projected prototypic continuing revolution, apparently thwarted in its own time and place, but vindicated by the eagle, 10. They now project through the eagle a world revolution continuing into the 20th century, 14 through 16. Right. So right there, it's a lot of roundy round with prototypical and protagonistic this and that, but it takes, it goes from Homer to the Renaissance to the current U S and that then if we go to the selected letters, um, yeah, he, he's sort of trying to do what Jung was doing, which is call, talk about the uh, collective unconscious and how things change even over centuries. I mean, because, right. of course, there was, there was not much communication um, in those prior centuries, and people weren't exposed to much information. And so right. they, they couldn't they couldn't really react to things. And so he's he's talking about these great flows of history uh, that were taking centuries to emerge. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And and he's doing it in short order. I mean, if I if I just did a hard return after every Roman numeral and made that into a poetic, you know, line. Mm -hmm. it, that's he's basically making bullet points in poetry in a way yes um to track us through from then to now yeah and and that's the interesting thing that's the interesting thing that attracted me to uh forrest reed's book which is 76 because you know these cantos you know i didn't have any concept of what the cantos were before nothing at all um mm -hmm. You know, as I said, Ezra Patton was basically a ghost at Hamilton College <clears throat> who kept floating through, but he didn't really impact me <laughs> directly. Right. And, I, and it, like you said, you were more in your logos land at that point and you, it wasn't of interest even. Right. Uh, well, yeah. Or I mean, yet. Yeah. I mean, I did take... English literature from a, from a gifted professor. And, um, and there were other English literature 
gifted professors there. Uh, and I really enjoyed, um, you know, memorizing all these poems <laughs> at the time, like when I was in, when I was a sophomore in college. Um, but, you know, it, it didn't, it wasn't my main thing at the time. I, my main mm -hmm. thing was, you know, how am I going to keep alive after college with facing the draft and, and, right. um, not the first 40 lines of the Canterbury Tales in the Old English. Right. I mean, it didn't seem very relevant at the time. Yeah. And um, and so I, anyway, um, I, you know, I'm now appreciating what happened because Forrest Reed is now putting this into context. And so I thought the cantos were, you know, just, you know, Ezra Pound bloviating. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, his individual bloviating. And he actually was a, a pedagogue. He was teach, he was teaching us a lesson. He did teach us a lesson. Mm -hmm. And and it's it it's been there for you and me to discover all along. And he knew that it would be discovered at some point whether he believed that uh, that discovery would lead to an ideal world, I don't know. I, doubt, I, I think he was probably pretty uh, um, doubtful. <laughs> by the, by the you know what, spent, I, I respect that. By the time that. he spent 12 years in the loony bin, I don't, I don't think he was quite as idealistic as he had been uh, before. Well, and I think... <clears throat> The one thing that I, if I if I'd have to play one consistent track of DNA, a, one strata through the archaeology of Ezra Pound, his attention to um, discipline and continuance, endurance, basically, um, is a hallmark. And most people who keep their nose in their work like that, which is a really positive thing, you you really learn your craft. Right. You look actually you you Fred Astaire Ginger Rogers dance with your craft. It's expert right. skill in play after a while. And that's the the sprezzatura where you can just pop off something with wit, like you know, Winston Churchill's wife to him about the street sweeper. Um, but that usually precludes not the idealism, it actually enhances the idealism, but it precludes the utopianism. Yeah. You know, which to me is good because then you keep a clean side of self in the idealism uh, well, and, and in community. And he did but, repeatedly talk about it's good for people to have different ideas. Yeah, the dignity and difference, right, right. right. And so he was constantly, um, you know, looking for good things in poetry, but not trying to change people to be little pounds. Yeah. In fact, right. if you were a little pound, he'd probably kick you out because he's like, no, we already have one of those. And that it reminds me of what our Oscar Wilde quipped off at a party. Um, <laughs> Sir, I suggest you be yourself. The rest of us are already taken. <laughs> well, that's good. So, yeah, so. anyway, that brings up uh, a comment. You, you've um, you've read ahead quite a lot. And uh, I think. You know, I'm I'm reading this like a like a fruitcake uh, in Jung's sense. So I'm look, reading his letters from 1907 on, and um, and that's the way I I, I usually run it. What I do is I I speed read the whole thing, yeah, and then I go through and sift for connection between 76 and Cantos, and then for next week too, then I start to, I'll drop back and I go systematically one by one, but I, right. I kind of get the lay of the land first. Right. So I, I don't think it's worth us discovering every letter, but at the same time, I, I want to pull out good points that I think are worth noting in culture. And uh, one right. of them has already come up. So I want to mention that. And that's in this letter to, um, uh, William Carlos Before we Williams. Do, yeah, go ahead. 
might I do the, it's just a, an excerpt from letter 117 that I felt went through with the Homeric oh, yeah, sure. the current U.S., but in a very mundane, getting something done way, just in his way. So it's from letter um, 117 to John Quinn. But the passage I'd like to begin with starts on the next page, 104. And it's down at the bottom, the show of Coburn's results. So the second paragraph from the bottom, just to the short end of that letter. Yeah, go ahead. The show of Coburn's results comes off here in February. He and I are to jaw about abstraction and photography and in art. And old GBS has promised to come out and perhaps chip into the jawing. The vortographs are perhaps as interesting as Wadsworth's woodcuts, perhaps not as quite as interesting. At any rate, it will serve to upset the muckers who are already crowing about the death of vorticism. It, the vortiscope, will manage any arrangement of purely abstract forms. The present machine happens to be rectilinear, but I can make one that will do any sort of curve quite easily. It ought to save a lot of waste experiment on plain compositions, such as Lewis, pl Lewis's plan of war or Wadsworth, the Wadsworth woodcuts. Certainly it is as good as the bad imitators, Atkinson, and possibly some Picabia. It might serve to finish them off, leaving Lewis and Picasso more clearly defined. Thanks again for fixing things up with Knopf. I will say nothing about periodical until I get your next letter save that it is very good of you to go on being interested after all my varied and divergent propositions. I'm glad the Vortices exhibit, exhibit is really open, but this letter is already long enough, so I won't expatiate. Regards to Yates Sr. and remembrances to Brodsky, and thanks again to you. But <laughs> So right there, he rips through all the history and puts forth you know, what he thinks should be coming forward, which is then his revisionist current current right. revisionist history of him trying to contribute to the structure of the modern art movement. Right. Um, so and, you had mentioned though before. Well, that. and, and uh, the, the view graph or whatever he was talking about there. Um, it, it's interesting that now we've gone far beyond this. In other words, um, you know, he's talking about some, some device that, that presented imagery in a certain way, but it was still two dimensional, right? Right. And, and now we have um, computers that will will give you all kinds of imagery right. in all kinds of different ways. Well, even just one of these, you know. I mean, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah one of the, one of those, uh, you know, even even back in the late nineteen nineties. Uh, or even going back to the late seventies when we started to get handheld ca calculators. Right. Um, they were, they had as much computing power as the guys had that went to the moon. Um, right. And, um, and so where we've gone with computing now is mm -hmm. so vastly different from where we were even in the seventies. Uh, well, I remember, was it 19, 1996 or seven? You know, and I have my Qualcomm black brick. You know, mm -hmm. this thing probably weighs two, three pounds. You know, it's the size yeah. of a regular receiver, but it's dense. Right. And, you know, you're switching hands because you're doing, you know, bicep curls with your phone all day long if you're running around everywhere. And, but now, you know, take the, my pinky fingernail and we could get four microchips that are each probably 50 times more powerful than that whole phone was, mm -hmm. you know, just right on the, right on the plane of my fingertail, right, my right. fingernail. Yep. Yep. Right. And so um, times have changed. We are changing with it, with them. And we, are vastly more multidimensional than even the people of the 70s, let's say, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, even my father, for example, and 
you know, my, my father used a slide rule. I carried a slide rule every day when I was in high school uh, <laughs> in, in with my books. Well, square and, roots, the room numbers. Right. <laughs> while you're talking to somebody, you know, right. Do, 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 do. right. It's just like, and you know, it's a mystery. It was a mystery then. And it's a mystery now how a slide rule really works, especially the more complicated ones. But on the other hand, uh, we are way beyond slide rules today. Mm -hmm. And yet we are able to keep up with it. Um, well, you know, I think, and I, I appreciate you brought the slide rule piece back up, especially with the technology, because you have something that is generative. It's going to generate a product. It's going to yeah. generate a response. And to tie this into culture even more specifically, two quotes that come to mind to me. The first one is, paint dries, comma, language never. So right. there's an art piece that's stable and not necessarily static, but it is positioned or posited in time. Mm -hmm. And there's then an art movement. And the second culture then, is, our second quote is, art drives culture. Technology simply supports it. So toothpick after dinner to technology, but the art is the most important part of the culture. So. Right then the technology of course drives what we can do with the art but the art itself to me is that kind of modus operandi the heart of the matter of what's important important about any given strata of time of culture through and history. that's that's the insight that pound had uh which mm -hmm. you know i never really grokked before but i'm accepting now that mm -hmm. you know it's uh, going back to churchill's comment if we're not going to save the british museum what we're what are we fighting for right right and and so you know if you want the trains to run we might as well be dominated by the germans let the germans yeah let the germans take over because they'll fix that yeah. sorry i just pulled my headset out so you were mentioning too the um when he was um speaking with uh, William Carlos Williams, which yeah. is what's interesting to me is um, almost indefatigably, William Carlos Williams is one of the best poets of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a country doctor. You know, I mean, this is poetry as a hobby that's actually a whole nother career. Um, and you want to talk about pouring yourself into creativity as well, he had, you know, like Carl Jung. Jung was creative and scientific. Right. And same with uh, William Carlos Williams. Being a country doctor, obviously, there's the scientific part. Right. But then the care and attention of a healer and then an artist in his words. Right. Okay. So uh, before we get into the letters, there are a couple of comments in the preface and introduction. Uh, that I think would are uh, worth talking about. Excellent. And uh, then we can get into high highlights of the letters, which I, I I've highlighted, and you're certainly welcome to highlight them. I just want to go through them more slowly. <laughs> no, and I get it. Unfortunately, the copy I got, um, though used. Someone only highlights by making open parentheses, close parentheses. So it's extremely easy to ignore the previous person's note taking. So I have to say respect to um, Homero, Homerovich is written in the front in a uh, oxblood fountain pen ink. <laughs> well, um... You know, I'm never going to resell my my used copies. I mean, this is my used copy, and yeah. I don't have any idea what the previous owner <laughs> thought about this book <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, they just <laughs> politely notated. I mean, it's just like a little whisper of calling to attention, which I appreciate because yeah. then I'll I'll be 
bullets, arrows. Okay, so, uh, and of course, American culture has been derided um, throughout the late 20th century, I think. And uh, so I just want to note on the first page of the preface that at the, the last, the begin, the last sentence, which runs over to the next page, to page uh, VI, but page V, uh, the last sentence, the glory of any nation is to produce art that can be exported without disgrace to its origin. And, um, And his, he says, if Pound was an expatriate, he was one who never forgot his own point of origin, but he was one who never deviated from his conviction that art has its universal province. Okay, so. Yeah, um, we were speaking about that earlier, just directly. Yeah. That he, he didn't stray. Um, staying with the idealism and not even looking towards the utopian stuff. Right. And, uh, and so the, in the preface, they admire the fact that he stuck with his art, which was poetry, but he was not only his art, but other people's art. But I love this. <laughs> I love this comment on page, uh, Let's see, it's uh, 23 in Roman numerals in the introduction. Um, okay, so they're right in the middle of the sentence at the top of that page, he says, uh, he thought well of nearly all organizations and institutions from magazines through universities to governments in their ideal forms. Okay, so this is, this is his flaw. Um, a bad magazine or university or government had merely departed from its ideal, perhaps because time had gone on and left it struggling for aims that were no longer valid, perhaps because it had been warped. The first of these did not bother him much. Uh, such institutions, while they lent a faintly musty odor of decayed thought to the ambience, uh, to the ambience would die without his help. <laughs> what moved him to, to decided action was the warped institution, which he assumed might function properly, but for ignorance at the top. And consequently, he bent his efforts to educating it. Uh, this would seem, and this is his his flaw because he was trying to educate us about the about Mussolini, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this would seem to be an excess of optimism, but he partakes of that American trait. Consider, for example, one of his earliest attempts to reform an institution. In 1916, he wrote to Professor Felix Schelling of the University of Pennsylvania, suggesting that the English faculty institute a fellowship given for creative ability, regardless of whether the man had any university degree whatsoever. He went on to name Carl Sandburg as a candidate for such a fellowship. Professor Schelling replied with what Pound regarded as the epitaph for the American university system. Quote, the university is not here for the exceptional man, unquote. <laughs> Pound apparently learned uh, for when in 1929 that university wrote asking for money, uh, he added the following postscript to an already negative answer, quote, all the U of P or your goddamn college or any other goddamn American college does or will do for a man of letters is to ask him to go away without breaking without breaking the silence. <laughs> <laughs> but five years later, in reply to a letter from Professor Schelling, he wrote, quote, you ain't so old, but what you could wake up and you are too respected and respectable for it to be any real risk. They can't fire you now. 
what, uh, why the hell don't you have a bit of real fun before you get tucked under at, uh, a last act of repentance as, as the curtain falls? <laughs> well, and let's let, to continue that theme directly, um, go to page seven, number three, to William Collars Williams. And I think it's spelling in context. Instead of dear Bill, it's D-E-E-R Bill because the letter two forward is D-E-A-R. Yeah. But he says, may I quote Steve on the occasion of my own firing? Gee, wish I was fired. Nothing like it to stir the blood and give a man a start in life. Hope you shine the improving hour with poesy. And by way of falling into the crowd, that does things here. London, D.O. London, is the place for poesy. Matthews is publishing my personae and giving me the same terms he gives Maurice Hewlett. Maurice Hewlett. As for your petit frere, little brother, um, I knew he'd hit the pike for Dagatolia. When does he come over? I shall make a special trip to, to Av for Dagatolia, or to Ave. Um, Ave Roma. Ave Roma, Immortalis, to hear the tale of Mister Robinson. If you have saved any pennies during your stay, and this is the best part of this letter, if you have saved any pennies during your stay in Nueva York, Nueva York you'd better come across and broaden your mind. American doctors are in great demand in Italy, especially during the touring season. Besides, You'd much prefer to scrap with an intelligent, intelligent person like myself than with a board of directing idiots. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh -oh. um, yes, I had marked the same uh, the same phrase about. Uh, uh, Gee, I wish I was fired. Okay, well, yeah. I've been fired a few times, and uh, you know, I've made some pretty colossal mistakes, I guess. Um, But as, as is said in the uh, quote here, for I know, uh, yeah, the note at the bottom of page seven, for I know that wailing and bitterness, bitterness are a yeah, folly. A folly, yeah. Right. And so when you make a mistake and have to pick yourself up, uh, including when you're, when you're fired for some reason, when you're, when you're fired, it doesn't mean you're wrong. It means that the whatever you're involved in uh, can't be in that organization. Well, and in that in that place, psychologically during a firing, um, especially you know when it's like me or you being fired, kind of thing, um, in the past, um, the process of business is for businesses to set you up to be able to make mistakes that they can afford for you to make so they can grow. Yeah. But there's a point where when you make a mistake that the company can't afford for you to make for them to grow, where they have to decide, does this create a change in mission or vision statement? Does this accent or accentuate the company Yeah. or, or, get the heck out because that's not what we do. So like you said, it's not that you're wrong. It's simply, it's a monetary piece and it's just business. And so that's one thing about not equating yourself with work is understand that financially you should not take psychological hits because of someone else's decision, right. you know? And that's, that's, I think what pound, you know, it's like basically, thank God, you know, nothing like Nothing like it to stir the blood and give a man a start in life. You know, yeah. it's like that's somebody lit the rocket, you know. Thank you. Right. All you can so, say is thank you. Right. So um, it, it happens before being fired. It happens before being hired sometimes. I'll give you an example. I had an interview for a, a top job at a, at a um, organization. It was a headhunted interview. And... Uh, and I went through various interviews with vice presidents, and then I was taken in uh, to meet the the chairman or, or president or chairman, whoever he was, the top guy. And uh, one of these vice presidents said, "Wow, I, you know, I, 
here's Conover and I think he's a game changer, quote unquote. Well, what I figured out very quickly because I didn't get the job was that this guy thought I would, I would, he would eventually be working for me and therefore right. he could, couldn't bring me into the organization. I would be a game changer. <laughs> right. And that's, yeah, that's when he comes in and says that that's, that's simple code for, are we willing to embrace change? Um, and, yeah. and if, if so, at what scale, but you know, game changer, that's company wide, you know, you're, you're knocking on the vision statement door. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Mar Mario says being fired sure sucks. Uh, yes, it does suck. But then the the point here is um, is the postscript. And remember, a man's real work is what he is going to do, not what is behind him. Avante right. e Correggio, advance with courage. Mm -hmm. So uh, what he is going to do, a man's real work is what he is going to do, not... Uh, what's happened to him. And I think that that's a very important point. And I think the firing can then give you a new perspective that you probably have been holding back from allowing yourself to view simply because it would be distracting. But then you have this freedom to spin around 360 up and down side to side and, and have a whole different, okay, that's cool. When I started this job, I was when I finished this job, I am, was, now, was, past. What's up now moving forward that's founded on, and I call getting fired, getting fired is one of the biggest cornerstones to brace against in life. Because you all of a sudden, you've got firm footing. That's a decision that's not going to change. So you can put a foot up against that and shoulder right into the future. You right. know. And just blast off. So yes, I think Mario, it, it, it sucks. But at the same time, I've looked at that as at every point there, I've, I don't waste trouble. I've made a diamond out of that misfortune. I've turned into, oh, okay, here's a forced new phase in my life. Cool. Thank you. I'll make my own job again. And I do. Yeah. We, which I've had to do since I was 39. And yeah. uh, which you know, the, the issue is here I am at age 39, a Japanese Chinese speaking lawyer MBA, exactly who is going to hire you, right? Because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, because, <laughs> and, and so since I was 39 years old, um, I've had to make my own job always. Yeah. Well, and those credentials, I mean, if I was looking at it to hire someone, I'm like, okay, cool. You're hired because you're a Mustang. Most people are going to say, oh, you're a Mustang. Make him, get him out of here as fast as possible. We yeah. don't need that upset here. And right. to me, that's one of the healthy parts of a business. But Well, and interestingly, I, I mean, I had this experience this spring of, you know, facing prostate cancer, of course, and, and, um, and the very first thought I had was to have my portrait painted uh, mm -hmm. as a legacy. That was the very first thought that came to my mind after I received the, the uh, diagnosis. And now I'm, I have that, well, all that radiation behind me. I don't I have to be still vigilant for the rest of my life. But, um, but anyway, um, you know, I, I, uh, I went to see Tim and I insisted that I had to be in his presence for a day. So if he was going to paint my portrait and I was quite right about that. And, um, uh, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, uh, what portraits do I like? And the one that I particularly liked was a portrait that was on the cover of uh, Seven Pillars of Wisdom by T.E. Lawrence. And Seven Pillars of Wisdom is basically the origin story for Lawrence of Arabia. And so 
at some point in the workup before I went to see Tim, I, uh, I made the comment to him, um, I lived it, that when I first read Seven Pillars of Wisdom 30 years ago, I had said at that time, I lived it. And so I mentioned this to Tim. And then I said, eh, why did I say that? So I went back and I, I got another copy of Seven <laughs> Pillars of Wisdom and I read it. And uh, when I read it, I said, yep, I lived it. And not only that, I've lived it several times, many times. I'm constantly living it because that's what I do. And, and um, not in the, in the military sense, but in the sense that what I have done in my career is basically pull together very different people and create something that, that none of them would have done on their own. And, um, and so I'm doing it twice right now, two times right now, um, maybe three, because this, this series that you and I are doing is sort of that also in the sense that, you know, we got going on it and, and now we're both attracted to it for reasons that are beyond understanding. But, um, but what is true is that, that I've always pulled these things together. And that is what um, the story of Florence Arabia is about, which, you know, sh shows, uh, you know, that when you enter a strange culture, you have to be respectful of it. Uh, you have to earn your spurs. In other words, you, you have to earn the respect of that other culture, whatever it is, whether it's a new, um, a new job where you are and, and, um, you know, if you go into a new job and you're full of yourself, you're going to get knocked down really fast. Mm -hmm. And what I learned very early on is uh, I look for the voids and I fill them. In other words, mm -hmm. I look for what isn't being done in, in an organization. Right. And I do that. And, yeah. and that is symbolized um, by everything that be, that is in the first half of the movie of Lawrence of Arabia, where he, uh, nobody thinks that they can attack Yambu because they have big guns there. And he's, he thinks about it overnight when in the movie it's shown as overnight. And he comes back and says, well, well we can do it. We'll just uh, attack from the, from the land side because they can't turn those guns around. Right. They get, they're only aimed at the sea. And of course that was the, the custom back then. I mean, even at Corregidor, the issue of at Corregidor and why it was defeated um, in World War II was that they had huge guns aimed at the entrance to Manila Bay uh, but they couldn't turn them around. And the Japanese attacked from the Bataan Peninsula, mm -hmm. uh, which the guns weren't designed to fight against. And so and they same were totally with, useless. Yeah, and same with the Maginot Line, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's. I'll be right. right back. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to point out was uh, in um, letter five, um, and I'm working with uh, selected letters of Ezra Pound from 1907 to 1941. And so at this point, we're in 1912, and uh, he's writing to Harriet Monroe, who he interacted with uh, for maybe 30 years. She was publishing Poetry Magazine at the time. And I think that's correct. And, um, and so he was trying to egg uh, Harriet Monroe into insisting on good poetry. Okay, I'm on uh, uh, letter five at the bottom of the page, Jordan. And uh, again, he Got makes, it. I make, again, 
So Harriet Monroe was the publisher of Poetry Magazine, right? And, mm -hmm. and he, he was trying to make Poetry Magazine sort of a vehicle for his idea of creating a modernist poetry that would be different from all the stodgy old stuff from before, I guess. Well, and to and, quickly speak to your previous about, you know, what, what you have put together, what you've cobbled together, what you've built is, you know, you know, I have the concept of dignity and difference and that's difficult for a lot of people, but you do, I have to say personally, you do that. If I even look personally at my own life and where I was in one place in the world last year at this time, and actually exactly about a year ago, and I look then at what I'm doing now, um, these weekly Jungian sessions, you know, Monday evening, Wednesday afternoon, some special ones on Saturday, Sunday mornings, it's, it's eight to 10 hours of, you know, it's a 25% of my work week, so to speak, my mm -hmm. standard work week, right? devoted to Carl Jung and to literally the alchemy, because there are lots of places where you and I are similar, but there are huge rocket fuel places where we're absolutely, you know, volatile, different, right. but not in a conflicting way, in a way that we can bring motion to the alchemy that you've put together. So I think I didn't want it to be lost, just that concept of the alchemy of the things you've put together, anyone out there on the YouTube channel. I mean, your perspectives are are respected and brought in and by Skip. And I think that you put your money where your mouth is. Um, a lot of people talk a good game, but they can't box, you know, <laughs> you know, one, once the mouth shuts, something else is over and it's not coming from the one talking. So, you know, but you, you talk a good game and you box. So, you know, yeah. I think that's an important alchemical piece to, to make note of here to substantiate yeah. what you had previously said. Yeah, I, wa I want to ask a couple points about the chat. Neil has said language is static now, and I'd like you to explain what the heck you mean by that, because language is not now, nor has it ever been static. Uh, I think it would, be more, it would be more interesting if we could learn a new language and speak that. Well, that is quite interesting. Uh, surely, uh, being naturally lazy, we mutter ourselves through the day. <laughs> well, okay, uh, but language is not well, static. Uh, and if I could speak to that directly, it it pissed me off to no end when I started to see, you know, lots of people are bad spellers. They always have been, but with the onsetting of onset of texting and emoticons, it got even worse. Because then it started to crumble out and we had the subsidence of the foundations of grammar. And then people basically just basically spitting concept words. And it took me until I realized, well, in Latin, one word is enough. It's a concept. And then the emoticons, I, I hate to switch gears and give it credit, but we're moving to a picture language. We're moving to hieroglyphs, but they're, they're yeah. preschool. They're, they're right. preschool. So they're far, not, they're preschool, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're preschool, but so that's not static. I think what's happened is I think the stature of Victorian and modern language evolution has now begun to erode culturally right. and not with those who love language, but yeah. I think that most people follow along with wherever the language is going and there's a certain hieroglyphic way of can you communicate what you want with just emoticons? And right. I'm playing devil's advocate to my own sense of living in the footnotes language mm -hmm. where I'll, you know, yeah. you'll see me write S I C in books on spelling and context, meaning, okay, stop bitching Jordan. Just, they misspelled it. Just leave them alone. Yeah. <laughs> I just, when I see S I C, I just think sick. <laughs> Yeah, well, and it is. It's sick. You didn't know how to spell that word. It's like, yeah. So, so Neil suggests that I should downgrade my CV, use the Trojan horse trick, and um, 
uh, you know, thank you for that suggestion to me, but at 75, I think I'm done um, CV and CVing and putting my CV out for a new job. I'm certainly not doing that. Well, I love the Trojan horse piece just to get a job kind of thing, except at the same time, I, I would have to, I want to clarify here because I don't know how many people in the world, people say CV all the time and it's Latin for curriculum vita, V-I-T-A-E. Yeah. A lot of people don't know, and that's your vital, vital curricula, yeah. the vital things you have done. So mm -hmm. I know there are too many MBAs in this world who can make a whole paragraph with only acronyms, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I just thought it was important to call out what right, CV right. means. And so uh, Thomas says Lachlan, Lachlan is in a movie uh, you guys may be interested if you haven't discovered the documentary already. I don't know what the documentary is, but I'd certainly love to know. Yeah, definitely. What? Um, yeah. So, Thomas, please do tell. This, yeah, let us know the title. Okay. So, in um, in you want letter, letter five? five, I'm just going to tiptoe through some of these highlights. <clears throat> in letter five, 1912. Um, and I believe it's true that Harriet Monroe was the publisher of Poetry Magazine. And so, um, and probably she was, you know, some wealthy woman who, you know, liked poetry and, and decided to write poet or publish a magazine about poetry and, and Ezra adopted her as his tool <clears throat> to, um, to push his ideas. So uh, throughout the early part of this book up into the 1930s, he's written her a lot of um, letters and he's, uh, he's, he, he's quite critical <laughs> for in some cases, but, oh, yeah. um, but here he is in 1912, which is at the beginning of this effort. And uh, of course, Poetry Magazine still exists and has a wonderful website and publishes a poem of the day. And if you don't know about that, it's probably worth um, getting the link to the poem of the day and seeing what's coming out now. Mm -hmm. um, and Thomas says, I came up in an Ezra Pound search of YouTube, perhaps from PBS some decades ago, about 50 minutes long. Okay, well, we'll look into that. And uh, good, good morning, Nancy. Um, we're, we're, deep hey, Nancy. Into, uh, we're deep into, uh, into discussing culture now. I'm, I'm just gonna pull up my highlights though, because we can't discuss every one of these letters, but there are certainly some that are useful. So. Now I'm going to punch ahead to number 27, uh, which is dated uh, November 7th, 1913, still before the war. Um, and, uh, and he makes this um, comment, um, uh, the gods do not care about lines of political geography. If there are poets in the US, anyhow, they oughtn't to be uh, poisoned in infancy by being fed parochial, parochial standards. Uh, Galdos, Flaubert, Turgenev, um, see them all in a death struggle with provincial stupidity uh, the metropolis is that which accepts all gifts and all heights of excellence, usually the excellence that is taboo in its own village. The metropolis is always accused by the peasant of being mad after foreign notions. Um, I just thought that was particularly, uh, and then he says, uh, regarding the rest, all I want is that the American artist presuming that he exists shall use not merely London, but Paris, London, Prague, or 
wherever as a pacemaker and that he ceased to call him champion for having done 100 yards in 14 seconds merely because there's no one around to beat him. The world's record being presumably 19.85.85. Or 9.85, right? 9.85, right. And, um, and of course that was happening because uh, in the movie, The Chariots of Fire, we have uh, uh, Abrahams, who's the, the hero of the movie and his, his speed is something like 14 seconds or something like that. Right, right. <laughs> and in, A slow in, lope. Yeah. And so in, in Great Britain, <clears throat> you know, and, and in the Olympics of 1924, 14 seconds was a, a fast time, but the, this was before we admitted any Ethiopians <laughs> to the Olympics. Or Jesse Owens popped in right in front of Hitler and right. made, made a beautiful spectacle. Right. And uh, Thomas has sent us the YouTube link, so that's cool. Um, and... Uh, I think I'm going to hit that link and see what happens. You know, something came to mind. Um, the metropolis is that which accepts all gifts and all heights of excellence. Usually the excellence that is taboo in its own village. I mean, it comes to mind. You can't be a prophet in your own hometown. Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. Right. Usually. Okay, so what happened when I hit that link was that it took me off of this chat so I couldn't see this chat anymore. That wasn't good, uh, but I'm going to copy it and create for myself another tab, uh, and then I can get it back. Hmm. It's bizarre. Uh, oh, I see. He's given me the chat, but it uh, it doesn't copy. <laughs> Swell. All right. Can you do uh, command all or control or command A or control A? Control and, A. Like click and see if it'll highlight the whole chat link comment. Okay, control. And then A. control C to copy it. Command C. And oh. then put the, go to a new tab and put command or control V as in very. Yeah, let's try once more. Yeah, sometimes you have to force, pick them out. Okay, well. The quick uh, keys. I guess it's not going to work that way. But anyway, thank you, Den uh, Thomas, for giving it a try. Um, if we could ask Thomas if he could click on it and give us the title, just because I think that I can type in 50 minutes PBS. Well, it, the title is Ezra Pound, actually. Okay. Uh, that I did see when I followed the link. Okay. Uh, yeah, the... Yeah, the title is Ezra Pound, and it's on a YouTube channel by S.P. Ward. Uh, okay. So, but unfortunately, when I go to it. The link okay. is static. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, Kushbu is with us. Uh, yeah, Chariots of Fire, the movie. Yes, that's what I was talking about. Thank you, Kushbu. Um, so... Thomas says, um, Laughlin was defending Pound. Alfred Kazin was enraged at Pound. I'll finish watching later. I'm glad to have found this if it helps. Thanks, Thomas. Um, yeah, well, there were a lot of people enraged with Pound because, mm -hmm. um, a, as I said, uh, he made a colossal mistake, and that was to... Um, be supportive of Mussolini. And as we saw here earlier in the discussion, uh, he 
never saw an institution he didn't like. And, right. um, and so he, he, was, he, he was deep in his poetry and, you know, I think he, he had a blinded view about political issues and that's I think so thing. and I and, think specifically too that he was probably attracted to the living intensity of the process that was going on instead of you know the USA board of director idiots that you know sat around twiddling their thumbs and self-flagellating their companies whereas something about Mussolini was just alive and it didn't even matter the politics. It was just the fact that there was intensity in life there. And I think he was moth to flame with that kind of, without discernment. Well, uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I do think that, you know, um, first of all, America is self-correcting and it, but that isn't because it was uh, born perfectly from the get-go. In other mm -hmm. words, it was it was uh, always intended to be amended. You know, the country was intended to be amended. The law was intended to be amended. And so, what I didn't know when I went to law school is that con constitutional law is all the U.S. Supreme Court looks at. That's that's their job. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you have a if you have a fight with your neighbor, you're never going to get that to the Supreme Court because right. it's very clear what the law is. But if the if the case involves a constitutional issue, then the Supreme Court might take it up. So right. um, I think the numbers are something like 17,000 cases are referred to the Supreme Court the, these days, and they take only about 200 a year uh, because they have some sort of constitutional um, relevance. And uh, we note that despite the fact that he appointed three justices to the Supreme Court, uh, Donald Trump has not been having his way necessarily with the Supreme Court. And well, and that's one of the integrity pieces of the Supreme Court is almost throughout history, it's almost impeccably consistent that once appointed, because it is a lifetime appointment, you know, the president better have vetted well, because there's a point where the word unleash occurs where now everything they've wanted to do their whole life based on, and not like totally changing course, but they can tune and tailor and listen completely from a justice perspective rather than the legal system perspective, because you're not removed except by death, you know? Yeah. And that, that creates quite, a, quite an institution in itself. Yeah. So uh, Nancy makes this comment, um, that one documentary emphasized pound hater Roosevelt and the banks. And, you know, I think Roosevelt was the, was the medicine that America needed at a given time at the, in the middle of the depression. Um, but that I don't hold it against him for uh, hating the banks uh, because I too hate the banks now after uh, fighting um, one particular financial institution to the to the Supreme Court of the United States and losing um, I now understand that this is the way it is and even though I was right on the law uh, nobody was going to ever say yes to me because if they did it would mean that every mortgage in the united states was no longer valid <laughs> well yeah yeah <laughs> which, which they are not i mean right. uh, and the court ended up giving my house to a bank that uh, didn't own it or didn't own the mortgage and uh 
Um, well, and to that point with the banks and with Nancy's comment about Roosevelt, I think the U.S. needed Roosevelt then because, you know, I mentioned earlier, some people, you know, you can talk a good game, but can you box? You know, it's like yeah. when you proof in the pudding and Roosevelt was beyond that. Roosevelt was a bull. I mean, you take a bullet in the sternum and then have a short 90 minute speech afterwards just because, well, it takes more than that to take a bull down, son, he said. I mean, there's a strength that the depression that he, I think he was in a sense, the numinous part from the shadow of the depression to people to look out of and not go completely down the strength in him and the clarity in him and also his intense loss. I think, didn't he lose his wife and his daughter the same night and maybe even his mom? Pound? No, no. Roosevelt. Oh, I'm thinking. Yeah. I think there was something like that. Yeah. I don't recall and, that particular. So he was able to deal with tragedy but in a heartfelt way and also remain a bull. Yeah, um, well, he, he, he spent five years in a, in a, a you know, an institution for, or an institution he created for sufferers from uh, polio. He had right. polio. And, mm -hmm. and he was, uh, as a result of that, he was an invalid. And the only reason he became president as we didn't have television uh, mm -hmm. in those days. I mean, it's, it's like right. me, you know, I'm, I now I'm crippled, but nobody, nobody necessarily sees that because I, you only see me from the, yeah. from the armpits up. Right? Our driver's driver's license ain't got no body, you know? Right. <laughs> it's like... So, so um, uh seems like i'm it might seem like i'm still quite vital but uh you know 12 days from now i'm gonna have my hip replaced <laughs> and, and that's not trivial no but and well soon you'll be vital as our first borg president you'll be the six million dollar man <laughs> yes well i'm already approaching that because yeah. uh, I was uh, I was impressed that my radiation treatments uh, cost about a thousand dollars a day for the 43 days so wow. I would say the yeah. overall the overall process was about fifty thousand dollars and you know when uh, when I was looking at the Marine Corps Reserve I had gotten out of the Marine Corps in 1971. Uh, I'd left active duty. I had a regular commission, so I could have served for 20 years at least and probably made it at least to major. I mean, that's sort of the max out, the honorable max out for a 20 year guy. Um, but, uh, you know, I went back in, in the reserve because I found out that if you serve 20 years in reserve, uh, then you at age 60 would receive health care for life. And, you know, that benefit when I was practicing law and struggling in the early days uh, from 1974 to 79, um, that benefit of health care for life was looking pretty good. And, right. and my instinct was, you know, whatever pittance the reserve pays and that in those days, it didn't pay that much. Um, but whatever that was, the health care for life for me and my wife for life uh, was a huge deal. And, and so that's why I stuck with it. And my instinct was absolutely right, because I've had to have so many surgeries to keep me going <laughs> and, and what I realize is that okay I, at you know age 43 I broke my leg in uniform the last thing I did in uniform and it as a result of that um, 
you know, over a 30 year period, I also lost my knee and my hip on the other side, which was com compensatory. So I really gave my legs to my country. <laughs> and I didn't realize it at the time, you know, when you're a young man, you think you're invis invincible. So you don't know you're, <laughs> you might be giving your legs to your country, but, you know, there's a reason they call it ground pounder. Mm -hmm. um, well, and that's you basically bring up the the reverse Trojan horse instead of um, dumbing down the resume, the curriculum vita CV um, to get a position. There's a point of value of taking any particular position from someone else. If you're going to, you know, help someone else build their dreams, kind of thing, um, of the pittance portion, except the long view point of value of the investment in what you won't have now based on what you will receive later. There's in a sense an, a long-term instant life insurance slash savings account going on in that point of value right. that, that makes a decision that's not just you know instant gratification. It's, it's looking at the whole long-term and you you don't always know, but at the same time in that situation, you kind of do know, because if you are able to stay in the risk versus the current low pay pittance risk versus the long-term reward becomes that point of value of right. making it worth it. Right. So moving on to uh, letter number 59 on page uh, 48 in 1915. So this is... Um, puts the return address as Coleman's Hatch, January. So it was January, 1915. So um, just after World War I had begun. Um, uh, and uh, I think what in, what's interesting here in this letter is the last paragraph. Um, which is my problem is to keep alive a certain group of advancing poets to set the arts in their rightful place as the acknowledged guide and lamp of civilization. The arts must be supported in preference to the church and scholarship. Artists first, then if necessary, professors and parsons. Scholarship is but a handmaid to the arts. Uh, my propaganda, for which some may consider novelty and excess, is a necessity. There are plenty to defend the familiar kind of thing. And uh, so that's a very interesting perspective he had. And it, I would say further, also clarity of his own vision, because that then speaks and dances right into Hemingway's statement of any poet writer that thinks they have not been influenced by Pound at this time has basically been to hell and said they didn't notice if it was warm or not. <laughs> or, you know, however the quote went. Um, yeah. yeah, because he was clear that to, um, to keep alive a certain group of advancing poets Okay, and um, on November 10th, so two months earlier in November 10th, 1914, uh, on page 47, uh, he was saying the proof of the College of Arts perspective, prospectus has just come and I enclose it. It was going to ask ACH to give it publicity, but I, I was going to ask ACH to give it publicity, but I guess you can use it as, an, as news quite as well. It is obviously a scheme to enable things to keep on here in spite of the war strain and what will be more dangerous, the war backwash and postbellum slump. But it embodies two real ideas. One, or A, that the arts, including poetry and literature, should be taught by artists, by practicing artists, not by sterile professors. 
those who can do, those who can't teach, (laughs) (laughs) and B, that the art should be gathered together for the purpose of uh, inter-enlightenment, inner enlightenment. Um, The art school, meaning paint school, needs literature for backbone, Uh, ditto the musical academy, et cetera. And, And so his view was that you know, literature was backbone. And, you know, I agree that, you know, once you write something down, then it's logos and, Mm -hmm. and then it's, uh, then it's hard and hard and fast. And, um, well, and it's interesting there about that. There's a kind of a binary fracture and, you know, doers versus teachers that has occurred over the last century Um, And I remember clipping that off to my dad one day, you know, those who can do and those who can't, they teach. And he, I don't know if I had heard him laugh so hard. He said, Jordan, those who can do, those who can't teach, but those who can do and also teach do better. So, (laughs) you know, know, I just, okay, zip my trap shut. Yeah. So ACH. um, I'm looking to see. I'm not, the name's not popping up. Yeah, I don't know who that is. Um, so um, here, here's, I, I realized that I had a couple of other pages, okay. uh, cir- page numbers circled that I, hadn't gotten back to. So I want to circle back for a minute. And um, so he's, um, uh, let's see, in 1913, he's talking to her and um, He says uh, in letter nine, um, until someone is honest, we get nothing clear. The good work is obscured, hidden in the bad. Uh, I go about London hunting for the real and find paper after paper, person after person, mildly affirming the opinion of someone who hasn't cared enough about the art to tell what he actually believes. And so, you know, the point is you have to care enough about what you're doing, I guess. Right. And care enough about what you're doing. I think if I could speak to that with letter number 43 on page 36 about then his legitimate care and insight into the psychology of other people that he was, where it's London, April. Dear H.M., the author of The Enclosed, H.P., his wife and infant are, I believe, starving or thereabouts. I have helped him, and I suppose I should do so still, but I'm strapped. He tried to start a magazine here on another man's promises, and he has got into such a mess that I don't think anyone else here will do anything for him. The poor devil had been keeping his poems for his own magazine, or I suppose I should have had them to go over before. Can you send him a check for the poem at once and print it when you have relieved the present congestion? Or does some supporter want to take him on? He has something in him, enough at least to make him worth keeping on the planet a few months longer. The last I had of him was to send him a telegraph order to buy food. Then he disappeared, ashamed to ask for more. And I heard nothing until his wife found my address among his papers and wrote from Leicester. He had been in London. Mm. So the care and attention, I mean, that's a, that's a call, an urgent call to not stop the presses, to go, go put a check in the presses and get that thing out to this person. I'm wondering who HP is, but. Yeah, good um, question. Um, okay. but that just the compassion there um. 
Uh, so, okay, I wanted to go back to, um, let's see, a couple of things. Um, back on page 12. Um, and I, I wanted to mention the, uh, the paragraph in italics. If one is going to print opinions that the public already agrees with, what is the use of printing them at all? Good art can't possibly be palatable all at once. And so, you know, that's, that's a significant mm -hmm. point, it seems to me. That yeah, I think you're right. That, um, yeah, it's to, if one is to going to print opinions that the public already agrees with, what is the use of printing them at all? And yeah, it's not so much to parrot what's already streaming through the psyche of the culture or society. It's um, that would be, he's basically saying that would be supporting not dynamism, but the singularity of just sound bites right. that, that do not give credence to the good art can't possibly be palatable all at once. Right. So then on page 13, apparently she'd written him and, and criticized one of his poems. And he says, for gourds and G-O-R-D apostrophe S, he means gods. For gourds sake, don't print anything of mine that you think will kill the magazine. But so far as I personally am concerned, the public can go to the devil it is the function of the public to prevent the artist's expression by hook or by crook. Um, uh, but. Oh, encora y encora. I mean. Yeah. What, what does that mean? I'm sorry. I think it's, let me, let me check, but you know, anchors on an anchor. <laughs> you'll, yeah, never anchor leave, a... you'll never leave the harbor. I think yeah, is what it means. But, but be sure of this much that I won't quarrel with you over what you see fit to put in the scrap backs of basket. So apparently she, he, she had criticized something that he wrote and uh, he said, well, please don't publish anything that you think is going to kill the magazine. Um, and so then uh, in 1913, uh, September, um, it means again and again. So again and again, right? which okay. would basically be an anchor on an anchor. You'll never leave the harbor. It's just going to wear you right. down like Chinese yeah. water torture. Yeah, you can't. You can't. Uh, you know, if you're going to be a a meaningful artist of any kind, you can't just stick with what is popular. And so even well, you, this, that's even not this art. YouTube channel. You know, I. Uh, I was waiting for the Jungian analysts to do something and they never did. So therefore, <laughs> here we are, here we are. And, um, and so, well, it's funny you mentioned earlier, you know, you, you would find the void and fill it. I always said I was the interstitial. I was going to be the connective tissue. I would be somewhere hidden in the heart of every department and also in between swimming around between every department and that's called coordination. And, you know, there's kind of a, a pre-development kind of gig that's always ongoing. And that connective tissue of the interstice, the space between, um, that's also the unconscious. That's where it feels like that, you know, that wells up from within to nourish everything that's here. Um, and it's a living portion of any thriving company. Yeah, understanding that connective tissue. So, right now, one of his points about the uh, impulse is important, and that's on page uh, twenty-three in letter number twenty-four again to Harriet Monroe. Uh, this is in nineteen thirteen. Uh, there's no use in a strong impulse if it is all or nearly all lost in bungling transmission and technique. This obnoxious word that I'm always brandishing uh, about means nothing but a transmission of the impulse intact. It means that you not only get the thing off your own chest, 
but that you get it into someone else's, yours pedagogically. So the point well, and there's is, Colleen's um, validation part, the sharing part of the creative act. Right. So you have to get things off your, your chest and it can be any creative act, but then um, uh, you have to get it into someone else's. So, you know, effectively that's what's happened with the, this YouTube channel, which is that I have gotten, you know, I was afraid I was going to be burned at the stake <laughs> by, yes. Jungian, by a Jungian analyst for some of the things I was uh, starting to say about Jung when I started to work and started to do readings and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I have to say, and what, what I got, just, let me just yeah. finish the sentence. So what I got though, was people saying, oh, this is really important what you're doing. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. Yes. I, I finally had my first public pushback last week. Um, a psychologist said, you know, you better be careful. You, 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 you just architecture well-being, that's just, you're hiding psychology. And I said, you know, I'm never going to be afraid of a whole group of alleged professionals who got sidetracked by B.F. Skinner and behaviorism and called it Jungian analysis. No, no, thank you. That kind of lack of clarity of vision, beyond bogus. Yeah. I suggest you step back to Freud and Jung and pick a side and then move forward. But don't even now. Um, don't even. And it was funny because they, they, you know, did the side of scans, but I just shut my trap after that. But there was, there was no rebuttal. And I basically hit him at the B.F. Skinner behaviorist clinical psychology foundation, except with, the, you know, the little tapper made by Caterpillar. It's going to just break the sidewalk up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And, well, but it, this, this is what tarot readers have been doing for 600 years yeah and which which is testing where psychotherapy finally came in above right. it a, as a profession but but to uh, dynamically integrate it with alchemy with science with medicine with healing with eastern i mean it's basically the human it's psychology is really the study of the human condition same right. as sociology. Sociology is just at a scale of a little more abstract with right. populations. Um, but yeah, but right. I was, I was, I think I was happy for an hour. Like, wow, I haven't had conflict like that in years. I missed that. So I, it didn't make me miss it to want to become an expert witness anymore. But I... <laughs> It's, right. Well, it was certainly you know, a nice until, so, until somebody comes with the cuffs and puts you in chains. I guess you can keep going, you know. Well, you know, ask for forgiveness instead of permission. And frankly, I I'm not doing fortune telling. And if anything, I'm like, well, because so you want to get me for Tarot and you have that on the ordinances. Don't psychologists do art therapy? And aren't those images Tarot related? I mean, it, it's too much crossover to, um, to not synonymize. I mean, right. this is just one person doing the same thing as another under a different guise, with a different name, a different method, a potentially different process, but all with the same outcome. Right. And now if this... I set up a meeting, I think just quickly, if I set up a meeting for all of this and did what I call the palo, what's the purpose, the agenda, the logistics, and our intended outcome? That's how you start a meeting, you know, sure. and um, and if I add psychology and tarot into that purpose for comparative analysis, um, the outcome is going to be, oh, look, here's a thesaurus. Let's go ahead and use these because, you know, they should be on the same line. <laughs> so anyway, right. that's my soapbox for the meeting. <laughs> right. OK, well, I, I have a soapbox, too, that I want to uh, come back to this one on page 47 about. Uh, which is about the prospectus of the College of Arts. Because I, you know, as you know, and I don't really know what your undergraduate career was like, but um, mine was the same as, as Ezra's was, essentially. Um, I had a lot of great appeals. And right. I had a lot of great appeals. 
and I batted a thousand. So that's okay. I, 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 I didn't take the status quo or what was handed to me as anything but a morsel to chew on. But right. there was, I, you know, I grew up with professors as parents. Here, you, these classes are going to bore you. Go clep them. Take tests. Don't take those classes. Get to what you're interested in. And then don't take any professor too seriously, especially, especially if they take themselves too seriously. So yeah. I, I think I, I had five years of an attrition-based low-key program because <laughs> my, my job was, their job was to make us cry. And my job was to make them change their grades. So <laughs> I see. Well, it never occurred to me to get people to change their grade. I, you know, I probably figured I deserved it. <laughs> well, and that's, I think that's what I got over young with, um, um, but this is my dad. He'd come home and say, uh, you know, this upstart kid, he's, this is his second grade appeal, but I oh, dang it. Just doesn't he have a point, you know? And, <laughs> So I just started to hear the, he respected the conversation and discussion of one. Um, but what's cool is, I mean, I, I was very active and yeah. I know I, I mean. Well, the, the point I, I, know I wanted I to make that. is that in a college of liberal arts, you learn how to learn. And right. in a, in an engineering school or some specific engineering type of program, you learn what to learn. And, right. and in my uh, observation over the last uh, at least 30 years, but maybe more like 40, almost my entire career, uh, I've had to reinvent myself very often. And certainly mm -hmm. in the last 30 years, I've had to reinvent myself every month every month mm -hmm. and and so what i really appreciate about the liberal arts school i don't remember a damn thing i learned at hamilton in the classroom but what i do what i did learn was to learn how to learn mm -hmm. so that i could uh then sort of grasp anything that i needed and you know if you learn specific things certainly in things like computer science or whatever, uh, things are changing so fast that if you learn what to learn, then, you know, if you learned uh, basic programming language back in 1980, mm -hmm. like I did, <laughs> which, which was a colossal joke actually, but I learned, I did learn basic programming language and, um, you know, it's, it's obviously quite useless today. And so you better learn how to get to the essence of what you need now. Okay. And I don't even know what computer scientists need today for our official intelligence, but. Uh, well, what you I know, you're saying learn how to learn. That's my, to tenor my great appeals. It wasn't an egomaniacal, I'm going to win. This was, if I'm going to take a blank piece of white paper, and end up getting a client to spend however many million dollars digging a hole and build something in the interest to protect the public health, safety, and welfare, which is the building code. Um, I better navigate my own damn ship. And part of that may, will mean I better navigate my own damn analysis of my own projects. And so if I had issue with, it was just intensifying the discussion to, you know, let's get Let's go against the wind and let's tack this sailboat, push the hull against the water to drive it forward with the sail the other way. And I think that sailing early on, not a whole lot, but enough that tacking of, no, I can go forward in the wind, with the wind or against the wind, but I can always go forward if I so choose. So then the ethics of do I or not. So I think the learning how to learn, I think, me coming to blows, even um, not physically, um, but philosophically, psychologically with certain professors was actually just them being older and wiser and me pushing up against not the authority, but their experience to mm -hmm. learn how to learn from them 
and in a sense by force almost trying to squeeze it out of them but you know but at the same time i was going to navigate my own ship i had a responsibility to learn how to turn the wheel you know right. or even yeah. where it was and uh, I'll just make one other point because we're near at the end of our time here. Um, page 53, at the end, there's a long letter to someone named um, John Quinn. But the thing that I wanted to highlight here is this. Uh, it's the last paragraph on page 53. Uh, my whole drive is that if a patron buys from an artist who needs money, parentheses, needs money to buy tools, time, and food, close parentheses. The patron then makes himself equal to the artist. He is building art into the world. He creates. And uh, I think that that is a, a very important lesson that we probably should propagate out into the world, which is... Uh, you know, become a patron of the arts. Um, you know, go out to art shows and, and various things, buy books of poetry if you like. But, uh, you know, I, I've bought a lot of original art, mostly from people I personally know. And, uh, you know, it's made a huge difference in my life. And, and uh, in Japan, I... I suppose I probably spent about $100,000 on art during that five-year period. I was being paid very handsomely at that time uh, because my living expenses were so costly. I, my rent uh, in Tokyo uh, in a 1,500-square-foot um, house, Western-style house, but... Uh, my rent was $7,000 a month. And mm -hmm. so I was being paid about $250,000 a year at the time. And of course, a lot of that got taken by the tax collector. But, um, but the point is that I bought $100,000 worth of original art and I had it in my house. And when it came to my divorce, the big thing that we arm wrestled over the day of the actual uh, divorce being finalized by the judge was over the art and uh, saying, well, you know, I want this, you take that type thing. And we did that all day long and we typed it all out. We signed it and um, then we went home and then I, called my ex-wife and said, well, I'll be over later on to uh, take the art that we agreed that I would have. And uh, she refused to give it to me. And, and I said, well, wait a minute. I actually bought this art for my daughters to enjoy and have in their home. And so, I'm not going to get, make a big deal of that about that. I'm just going to buy more art, mm -hmm. which is what I have always done. And um, well, and you came to the level then you were creating art. You were supporting the creation of art in their lives, the creation of the promotion of art in their lives with that. And right. it's interesting to me that even in urban design, there's a huge um, not chasm uh, or schism, but what is a wealth creator versus what is a wealth producer? So wealth creation and wealth production and that patron who steps in to become at the same level of the artist to buy them supplies and food, et cetera, is promoting the creation of art. And that's a wealth production a wealth creation yeah. rather than wealth production would be the publishing house that then puts that work out. Um, yeah. so distribution. Uh, with that, I do want to share one wood block print that I bought 40 years ago, and I, I keep it literally in front of me right over my computer, so I'm going to uh, end my virtual background for the time being, uh, and then I'm going to show you this piece, which is right above my computer, um, and... 
So there's my computer and there's the piece. Uh, let's see. Okay, there's the piece. Oh, behind the... Okay, so, so this piece, uh, let me mm. just describe it to you because it reminds me of how to succeed and um, and Neil, Neil says, we talk a lot, yet we all stay in the same place. I am still looking for the miraculous. So Neil, here is the miraculous. Uh, this piece is called which means the forgotten gate. Now what this is, um, is a gate that was on a temple and um, it was it was removed from the temple and they moved it around and back to keep it because they it was a wonderful piece of structure that they wanted to keep and so they moved it behind the temple uh, and so it was a gate but it was a gate to nowhere uh, and then what I love about this gate too is that the the blue in the in the roof there is actually um, plastic that was put over the roof to protect it, and that's all ripped up by the weather and that sort of thing. So this is actually the twice forgotten gate, and uh, that that forgotten gate is the entry that I make into anything I do um, to make the difference, okay, which, and it makes all the difference because, um, you know, people get into anything, any, any, um, any topic and uh, they get stuck in what everybody else has done. And, what has made all the difference for me in my career is that I always look for the forgotten gate, uh, the thing that no one else is doing. And that's what I have, that's how I've had this miraculous career that uh, many people are envious of, I think, in some ways. Um, you know, uh, I've lived nine lives, I've gotten to do many things, and um, pretty happy about that <laughs> well you know i the bridge at argent wheels monet uh -huh. is my is my favorite painting i always have it as my phone background oh, but yeah. the front the front boat has no people in it and there's a bridge from it almost looks like Bollingen and over yeah. there but part of it's truncated coming across but there's water there's a bridge there's uh, I, just I've, a minute i'm going to change the view here so that I have speaker view and, and then you can show that. All right, show it. It'll be on a larger screen now so that people can see it a little bit better. And Argent Wheel, or Argent Wheel, uh, A-R-G-E-N-T-U-I-L-L, -L, or L-E-S, mm -hmm. I think 1857, Monet. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite painting in the world. And yeah. it's not because it's so masterfully, brilliantly painterly. It's because I have, as a tarot card, I have never asked that painting a question that it couldn't answer. It's yeah. as if it's every tarot deck ever. And it's just, it tells a story across, um, across ages. And so, as you mentioned, the, the Forgotten Gate is your entry into everything you do. That's, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that, thank you, because that actually gives me not that's my favorite painting cliche. It's an entry into everything I do. And there's a certain, it so resonates with me that it's not even asking it questions. A lot of times it's just looking into it without a need for words. Yeah, well, and, it, it, and it goes back to my original earlier comment that I always, whenever I enter into something, um, some new, job or whatever it is i always look for what's not getting done right. and and uh and when when you just voluntarily go and do these things that are not getting done very often people start to give you more and more responsibility um mm -hmm. because they they know 
they know something should be done, but they never get around to it. And so I always look for the things that people are not getting around to. And those are the things that I get done for somebody. And it, it very quickly, I mean, I'm saying in, le- in three to six months in a new organization, if you do that, uh, you start to get noticed very, very fast. And all of a sudden you become the, you know, the, the pet of every mentor in the organization. Mm-hmm. And, and what's interesting is it connotes an insight into the process that's mature enough to not have to blow the foundation every time a change needs to make. It takes the pesky idealism and inserts it into just observational skills and that you have an insight into the process and sequences of a company um, that then can be consulted to then entertain whether to implement the things you come to or not. Yeah. Now, Natalie says, uh, sorry, I was writing a note and I missed what the art Jordan mentioned. Can someone type here? Uh, Can someone type that for me here? So do you have the chat available to you, Jordan? Or Not on YouTube, but hold on once. Hold on. I will. Let me see. Oh, if you can put it in the, in the chat here on Zoom, then I can, uh, the name of the piece, then I'll move it over to YouTube. Yeah, let me. Um... Yeah, it's the Bridget Ar- Argentuela. Uh, yeah, let me, I'll type it in here. Hold on, let me. Uh... Okay, so we, we will pull that in for you, Natalie, and that will be um, and interesting, Neil, that you should mention glue um, because, um, you know, in my uh, big organization, the one that, but it's true of all the organizations that I've made, mainly been involved in, um, people would ask, what is it that you do here? <laughs> and, and my answer, um, spontaneous instinctual answer was, I'm the glue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so Neil has mentioned glue here, so I had to do that. And so Natalie, it's no problem that you want to um, uh, want to have that reference because uh, we're essentially done here. But so Jordan, do you have- Here we go. So I pasted that in. All right, let me grab that. I will cut and paste. And uh, this should be it with the link. Uh, Yeah, and there's the name. I think it was 1857. I typed it from memory. I didn't know. Rigid Arjun wheel. Okay. Um, so, it just seemed to be a painting that had a one whole world self contained, and it was, they're just everything emotionally, yeah. scale wise. Um, now, for a, lo- for a while, um, my, my protege, um, Lana Shaheen, had given given me a painting uh, some years ago, um, which is called uh, The Mother of the Martyr Kept the Governor Waiting at the Peace Ceremony. And I had that in this place of honor over my computer, Um, but I really had this painting um, for 40 years and And that has been, you know, the most important metaphor, I suppose, in my life. I I had uh, the the mother of the martyr up for um, for several years because I had been through some things in the Middle East, and um, and in Lana's honor, I'd had it up there, but I have it at another place now in my house, and. and so let me just 
mention as we conclude here that uh, several of us, and I think Jordan is going to be somehow a part of this, that uh, we're putting together a confluence of psychology, art, religion, and education uh, in what we're calling a confluence in Helena, Montana next June. It'll be the 10th to the 14th of June, uh, 2022. And uh, we're working hard on it. Uh, I'm growing a mustache so I can rock the part of uh, Carl Jung in a play that we're going to be doing. That play has now been uh, made public uh, on YouTube. And so you can actually see a performance of it uh, on the uh, Chiron Publications website. Um, and, um, and so I ur urge you to look for it. Uh, the name of the play is The Analyst and the Rabbi. Um, and, uh, and the people that played in this play in the version that's available on YouTube, um, commented that playing the play live was extremely emotional experience and very meaningful to them. And uh, as I'm taking one of the parts, the part of C.G. Jung in the play, I can well imagine how emotional it's going to be <laughs> because Dr. Jung takes a lot of um, abuse at the beginning of the play and uh, deservedly, okay, deservedly, no question. And, um, and so, you know, having a friend actually aim that abuse at me at the beginning of the play is, is going to be uh, something, but I'm starting to get used to the idea of it. And I've been studying the part for some time now. And so we're doing that uh, next June. And if you, it will be an invitation only event. There will only be 30 people uh, invited to attend. And so if you're interested in having an invitation to that event, you really must let us know, let me know. Uh, and uh, you can do that at skip.com over at gmail.com. And- uh, You know, Skip, it's interesting at the up. beginning of the play, as much abuse as Jung takes, there's this whole larger scale fleshed out story of just that simple short conversation between Marie-Louise Marie von Franz and the theologian where she can connotes the living divinity within the psyche. And then he has a dead, no longer publishing any more work divinity. <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I, that's a favorite of mine. So I'm going to share it here now, since you mention it. Um, okay. I'm referring to uh, the alchemy. alchemy by Marie Louise von Franz. I'm currently reading this book into the YouTube channel. Uh, I haven't gotten to this particular passage. I've read the whole book, but I haven't gotten to this passage in my reading online, but hopefully I, I will in the coming week. But I want to share it with everyone because uh, the important distinction that she is making here is she's in a in a uh, sort of serious discussion with a theologian and um, and the theologian thinks that God has said everything he's going to say and that's all in the holy books and really Marie Louise sa says to him, well, you see your God is dead and I see him, we see him as living. And so let me just, um, I'll just read that uh, eight line passage. Okay, so this is a remark from a theologian. I think God has already given his unique answer in each case. Okay, that would be the holy books, right? Dr. von Franz, that is where we differ. You think God has published general rules that he keeps himself, and we think he is a living spirit appearing in man's psyche, 
who can always create something new, remark, within the framework of what he has already published, Bon France, to a theologian, God is bound to his own books and is incapable of further publications. That is where we lock horns. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I mean, and, and well, that, she's in a, people didn't understand when they were in discussion with her. She was always in a serious discussion, meaning reflection, listening, and it didn't matter if even she wrote it. She ha it's just like Alan Watts, you know, you have no responsibility to be even who you were five minutes ago. She would continually just re-energize the calculus of her own life and her observation skills were just so deadly insightful. Yeah, yeah, let's see. Um, so here's a lovely comment from Neil. Uh, thanks both both of you uh, been great again my only place for an uplift Hooray. you're welcome you know, i that, appreciate that, that yeah that's a wonderful thoughtful yeah. comment and thank it, you it makes this effort somewhat worthwhile <laughs> it is worthwhile there's no qu question that it's worthwhile it makes it worthwhile and that's why we do it in fact so thank you very much that's that's, worth, that's yeah. a high accolade and, and very very taken to heart. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, so Jordan, go on with your day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Peace. Peace. Take care. Take care. Thank you, everyone, for watching us today.